The Crown season three kicks off in 1964, 17 years after the start of season one. Now that's a lot of history. The season ushers in a new era of Beatles, Silver Jubilees and Moon Landings. The Queen is now rapidly approaching her 40s. Charles and Anne are coming of age and Britain is a very different place. Whether you're after a refresh or are brand new to The Crown and want to jump straight in, this video is for you. We're not recapping everything that happens in season one and two, just the key parts of the story that have a big impact on season three. Quick reminder, the timeline of The Crown is factual, but it is a drama. So while The Crown is meticulously researched, some creative license is used to drive the personal stories. Season three sees Elizabeth contemplate the life she could have had if she'd never become queen. Because if you remember, she was never really meant to wear the crown. Her uncle, Edward VIII, great-grandson of icon, legend, and star Queen Victoria, ascended the throne after the death of his father. However, in a shock twist only the British monarchs know how to serve, Edward abdicated that same year because he wanted to marry an American divorcee named Wallace Simpson. This love for her has destroyed everything. It is love. You see, as the king of the United Kingdom, he was also head of the church, and marrying a divorcee was out of the question. So he chose love and moved to France. There's a Madonna movie all about it for those interested. But what does that mean for Elizabeth? Well, with Edward gone, his little brother Albert, who had lived in his brother's shadow until now, stepped up to become King George VI. With a new king came a new heir. Enter Elizabeth. Okay, let's fast forward to 1947. Princess Elizabeth marries Philip Mountbatten in a super understated ceremony. In The Crown, we see Philip portrayed as a very proud man who struggles from the off when it comes to joining the royal family and being second to his wife. That's a dynamic he continues to struggle with throughout the show. Though, as he approaches middle age in season three, we see his concerns shift slightly as he comes to terms with having lived a life of duty rather than a life of passion. After marrying, Elizabeth and Philip have four children, Charles, Anne, Andrew, and Edward. In 1952, King George VI dies following a lung cancer diagnosis. Elizabeth, who remember, was never really meant to become queen, does just that. At George's funeral, we see his older brother return to the UK, which caused quite the pickle. More than a year later, and it's time for Elizabeth to be crowned queen. When we see this period in The Crown, we see Philip ask to be excused from bowing to his wife at her coronation and ask that his children not lose the name Mountbatten. After some back and forth, both are answered with a big resounding, No. Now that we have our queen, this is a good time to remind you that she had a younger sister. A younger sister who lived in her older sister's shadow. Sound familiar? In season three, we see Margaret step into the spotlight very publicly and hear some iconic limericks along the way. And her arsehole in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> but we're also seeing a woman dealing with marriage woes and forever being second fiddle. Jumping back to the 40s and 50s, Margaret was often said to be the louder, more rambunctious of the sisters. She's certainly a lot of fun in the crown, and when she deputizes for the queen and goes totally off script. Our ambassador to the United States of America, Sir Roger Makins. The only honest thing to come out of Washington. She causes a stir with people including the Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the Queen herself. That defiance of protocol continues in the new season. In 1953, Margaret became involved with Peter Townsend, a former RAF officer and later Queen's equerry. The public love their relationship. Press men and sightseers hoping for a glimpse of the couple. But Townsend is a divorcee, which, as we've learned, is less than ideal. Long story short, the church, parliament, and other senior royals do not approve of the union. Townsend is sent away, and ultimately the relationship ends. Despite promising to never love again, Margaret eventually pairs up with a fairly nice, fairly boring man named Billy Wallace, but eventually breaks it off. In a very Love Island move, Margaret then picks a sexy bad boy photographer named Anthony Armstrong Jones. We see it all go down in season two when he was taking official portraits of her and true to form, she went rogue and sent a seemingly naked photo of herself to the UK tabloids. It appears she's naked. A lot of hoo-ha later and eventually in 1960, the two got married and went on to have two children. 
Keep an eye on that particular union. It's a big and messy plot point in season three. There are a couple of really incredible episodes in season three that focus on Prince Charles and his coming of age. In season two, we saw his father struggle with a seemingly sensitive child. Or he might just become another wet namby-pamby mollycoddle twit. Philip believed his own upbringing made him tough, so the same needed to be true of his eldest son. We saw Charles struggle when his father insisted he attend Gordonson School, and the two continue to have a troubled relationship now that Charles is growing up. Back to the Queen for a sec. Our story has seen some ups and downs in her marriage over the years. The power dynamic with Philip is a key thing to keep in your mind, and we've watched it play out across many episodes. The two are arguably more settled in season three, and we see some real moments of love, but there's no denying Philip is a complex character with a lot of baggage. The other thing to note is the way her stoicism is portrayed in the show. When she met Jackie Kennedy in season two, we saw her ability to deal with bad behavior in a proper fashion, where others might have screamed and shouted. I'm quite sure that you meant no harm, no disrespect. After all, why would you? In season three, we see key moments in her life when you may expect a more emotional response. But after years of being on the throne, she's learned, as Margaret put it, You cannot flinch. That's pretty much what you need to know about our story thus far. There are a few other things you should probably know about the UK in the 1960s. One of which is the swing to liberal politics. The Conservative Party had been hit by a sex scandal, the Profumo affair for those interested. And that, as well as a growing liberal movement across the country, led to a small Labour majority win in 1964. We see some of the ups and downs of the politics in season three, so we won't share a load of spoilers, but with the growing liberal movement came a renewed sense of anti-monarchy sentiment across the nation. It's fascinating to see how it plays out in season three. We want our heads on spikes. One more thing, and then we'll leave you to it. Miners. The struggle of the miners in 1960s and 70s Britain is well documented. We had a national coal board trying to keep costs down and a national union of mine workers who wanted increased wages, fairer working hours, and a change to safety conditions, among other things. The two got into many disputes over the years. In season three, we'll see our monarchy react. Finally, meet our cast. We're 17 years ahead by now and everybody is a bit older. In fact, the queen herself is in her 50s by the end of season three. Olivia Colman is wearing the crown as Queen Elizabeth II. Helena Bonham Carter is playing Margaret. And we have Tobias Menzies as Prince Philip. Ben Daniels plays Tony Armstrong Jones, Margaret's husband. Charles Dance is Lord Mountbatten, Philip's uncle. Marion Bailey is the Queen Mother, while Josh O'Connor and Erin Doherty play Prince Charles and Princess Anne, respectively. Okay, we're done. You're all caught up. Watch The Crown, now streaming on Netflix. <laughs>